Welcome to Fitz Dog Radio. I am your lovely, lovely guest, Greg Fitzsimmons. I would have been a beautiful woman, I think. I have nice legs. I have shapely. My wife has called my legs shapely. Good calf definition, little shelf at the bottom of them. Good buttocks because I rollerbladed and played hockey. And uh, yeah, I think I could have been quite a doll. I could have been like Blondie. <laughs> I, uh, I, uh, is that how I'm going to do my podcast? Am I going to say I, uh, all the time? I've noticed that little tick. I don't, I don't usually listen to my podcast, but I listened to one recently and I realized that's, that's a tick that I have. I need to stop. Played some golf this morning. I got a regular game with a bunch of guys every week and something kind of fun happened this week. One of the guys shanked one, Dave shanked it to the left this guy's a comedian i'm not gonna say his last name not david tell shanked it hard to the left and we all scream <laughs> we all scream four at the top of our lungs and look it's a public course people are yelling four a lot because it's a it's a low quality golfer out on a public course you hear four a lot so we yell four and all of a sudden Boom. Lady goes down. I, I, I'm not laughing about it. I am laughing about it because she was okay. But it hit her, ready for this, in the fucking shin bone, right on the inside of her shin, dead center. By the time we got down to her, it was the size of a baseball. It was black. It was huge. And it... I felt really bad for her, but she was pretty tough. Like she wasn't crying and, you know, she was, and she wasn't mad at him because we did yell for her. <laughs> and we play all these games when we play golf. Like if you hit a tree that, and you still make par, that's called a barky. And you, you, everybody has to pay you a dollar. If you do that, if you get it in the sand and you make par, it's a sandy. And so we told him if he made par, we'd give him a leggy. But the truth is he didn't hit the shot. Like he rushed over to her and her whole group was standing there and they called the clubhouse to send somebody out in a cart with some ice and to bring her in. And uh, like, you can't then walk up and go, can you, can you just, can you just move over a little? I got a, I got a five iron here through the tree. You know, you just, he just had to pick up. As a matter of fact, I was up after him on the tee. It was my turn. And after he hit her, I did ask. I go, I don't hit it now, right? And they're like, no. Like, what What if I, <laughs> what if I hooked it like he did? And we had to yell for again. She would have had such bad PTSD. So I just picked up and I dropped it in the fairway. Um, but we did not stop busting this guy's balls for the rest of the round. Every time he hit the ball, we would all start screaming, four! <laughs> oh, God. Anyway, good luck to her if she's listening to the podcast. Hope she's okay. She's not walking for a while. She's she's on a cane for sure. And there's morphine involved, you know, Viking and something. She got a, she got a good script from a doctor somewhere. And I remember when I was a kid, um, a friend of mine, we were at the, this sounds like an improbable story, but this is absolutely true. My my dad belonged to a golf club. So me and me and this kid, Brian Tompkins, were at the um, practice range hitting balls. And um, it was right next to the Fifth Fairway, Knollwood Country Club. And all of a sudden, thud, Brian goes down, hit in the head with a ball. And, uh, and, ah, I just fucking did it again. I'm going to catch myself. And so golf cart rushes over and who is it? Who hit the ball that knocked my friend down? I can't remember if he got knocked out, but he got knocked down. It was his father, George Tompkins, hit Brian Tompkins with a ball while he was at the practice range. We were like nine. I think we were like, or seven. We were young. I hope you're okay, Brian, if you listen to the podcast. I hope you're good. He was uh, he was a little off after that. Wasn't quite the same kid. 
Owen left for college. Uh, well, didn't really leave for college. He left for Chicago. He will be taking all of his classes online, but he decided to go to Chicago where his school is located and live with some other guys in an apartment and try to have something sembling a college experience. So he'll be gone. It's very sad. I hate when he leaves. I love the shit out of this kid. And he keeps me going. He keeps me honest. He had me working out. This whole quarantine, he's, we got kettlebells, we got a heavy bag, we got a chin-up bar, we got those rubber straps with the grips, uh, yoga mat, some push-up handles, uh, jump rope. I mean, we were doing it. We were doing hard workouts, and that's not going to happen again. I can tell you right now, I will, I probably will not work out again with him gone. So it's all about my daughter now. Jojo, who I also love the shit out of, totally different kids. And so what we've done with her the last four nights, she's she's into watching movies and kind of ironically, she likes to watch bad movies with us. So we watched all the high school musical movies last year and now we are, tonight we'll watch our fifth Twilight movie in five nights. I can't tell you how bad these movies are, how how unwatchable the acting is. There is no sexual energy between the star, what is her name, um, whatever her name is, and the other guy. Nothing. I mean, they are zombies. There's no, there's nothing warm. They just stare at each other and they're quiet a lot. And we're supposed to feel something. I don't know. Apparently kids did. Kids loved these movies. They made five of them. So who am I? It's one of the you know biggest selling movies of all time, probably. Who knows? But the fourth episode is kind of funny. Is the fourth episode was all about she gets pregnant. I, I don't want to. <laughs> I'm sure I'm not running it for anybody. But she gets pregnant. And she's still a human. But the father of the baby... Well, he's a vampire. So it becomes a big question, ethical, physical, medically, can she carry a demon fetus? And the demon fetus begins to suck up all of her nutrients and it breaks her ribs. It's, it's, it's gonna kill her. It's, it, it, the, the fetus may kill the mother. And so then it becomes this whole uh woman's right to choose thing where she's choosing to keep the baby and all the men are telling her to abort literally in this like teen movie they're all telling her to abort the fetus and she keeps i'm not gonna tell you how it ends but she doesn't die because there's a part five but it was i was caught me off guard it kind of out of nowhere anyway what else what else happened this week i did um I did this podcast. They asked me to do this podcast. It's this really big deal over in London. It's called The Greatest Music of All Time. And it's normally video. And they, you know, they had everybody on there, like some of the biggest music stars of all time. I think he had Elton John on. And, and I just watched the Annie Lennox one. And anyway, so they asked me to do it. And you, they basically ask you what your top 10 albums are. And then you discuss them. And so I said, I could, I could kill myself trying to come up with the perfect 10 albums. So instead, I set my timer for 20 minutes and I said, you got 20 minutes to come up with what you think are the 10 greatest albums. And I thought my criteria, criterion or criteria? I think criterion is singular. Criteria uh, is plural. My criteria is it has to be music that you have to sit down to listen to. It's not background music. It's music you put on headphones and you make sure you got a, you got 40 minutes to fucking sit and focus, maybe a few minutes afterwards. Uh, or at least like I'm in my office and I'm doing the kind of work where I can really kind of focus on the music. Anyway, it has to tell a story. The album has to be coherent. There has to be a reason why every song is on that album. They have to feed each other. Uh, there has to be themes. There has to be a... Um, uh, uh, things that make it come together stylistically, lyrically. 
And also it sort of should be significant in the lifespan and career of the artist. Like, is it a turning point? Is it a first album? Is it a last album before a breakup? Whatever. So my albums, and I'll do this quickly because who gives a fuck? Everybody's fast forwarding like, oh God, I want to hear this guy's top 10 albums. I'll say them real quick. Blue by Joni Mitchell. Blood on the Tracks by Bob Dylan. So many great albums by him, but that's the one. These are ones that, for whatever reason, for me, when I'm feeling down, I want to listen to, or when I'm feeling up, I want to listen to. There's emotional resonance for them. Uh, Pet Sounds by the Beach Boys. Axis Bold as Love by my man, Jimi Hendrix. Uh, Astral Weeks by Van Morrison. That might be my number one. Live at Leeds by The Who. Um, which is the only live album on the group and uh, on the list and my favorite live album of all time. This Year's Model by Elvis Costello. Heart of Saturday Night by Tom Waits. Darkness on the Edge of Town by Bruce. I know a lot of people say, who's that guy over your shoulder there? He's hard to recognize. That's Bruce Springsteen. Um, and finally, Paul's Paul's Boutique by the Beastie Boys, which doesn't fit in. The The rest of the songs are kind of like either rock or folk, and Paul's Boutique is, is rap. So anyway, those were them. But I had a great time talking to this guy, Tom, who hosts it, young kid, but he's a, he's a great interviewer. So check it out when it comes out. In the meantime, if you want to listen to that podcast, here's the best way to do it with, with the best in my opinion, best wireless earbuds on the market. Uh, and they happen to be half the price of the other leading uh, brands. Uh, I've been listening. I, I have earbuds in literally all day. I have them on. I sleep with them because I listen to audiobooks. I'm listening to Frederick Douglass's audio, autobi or biography right now. And then... Um, I ch and then during the day, I listen to podcasts. I, uh, Joe Rogan and Duncan Trussell did a podcast that was five and a half hours that I listened to the entire fucking thing, and it was really great. Recommend it. And I checked out Springsteen's got a new song came out this week called Letter to You. Check that out. So, um, so, um, I, uh, God, don't spend like a ton of money. These are ha literally half the price. And uh, for some of you guys, that, that makes a difference. Some people, I don't know. If you've got money you don't, you don't care to save, go ahead. But I'm telling you, these are the best. So I love my wireless earbuds from Raycon. That's right. I buried the lead. I didn't tell you right away. Raycon. They're noise canceling. And normally when I want noise canceling, like if I fly or if I run, I got the big heavy bows with the switch. These cancel just as well. The new model, the everyday E25 earbuds, everything I always wanted in earbuds. It's got, it lasts for six hours. The Bluetooth connects instantly. As soon as you turn it on, boom, clicks on. Rich, full base. The design is so sleek that I can sleep with my head on the pillow without them sticking out. Um, it's, it's you know, look, my wife snores. I've said it before. I need to block her out while I'm listening to my audiobook. I run in Venice Beach. It's loud. Can't hear anything. Looks cool. Nobody sees them. Company was co-founded by Ray J. And you know who loves these? I'm going to drop some names right now. Snoop Dogg, Melissa Etheridge and Mike Tyson. What do those three people have in common? Nothing, until now, until Raycon came along. Give them a try, 45 day free return policy so you can make sure they're the pair of wireless earbuds for you. For a limited time, get 15% off your order at buyraycon, R-A-C-O-N dot com slash Fitzdog. That's buyraycon.com slash Fitzdog for a special 15% discount on Raycon's wireless earbuds. Make sure to check it out now while the deal's running. Buyraycon, R-A-C-O-N dot com slash Fitzdog, F-I-T-Z-D-O-G. There you go. Other thing I want to mention is I'm paranoid. When it comes to the internet and the things I'm doing, 
I don't need to tell you what I'm doing, but I'm paranoid. I want to hide my internet and my email. Uh, so I use a VPN and the best one out there is private internet access. They've got over 30 million downloads, completely safe. The whole like in incognito mode, that's a joke. It doesn't keep you private. It's like a bike lock with the thin wire. Yeah, why bother? You can use private internet access to keep all your online activity out of the hands of your internet service provider. Hackers, snoopers, douchebags, they're all coming after you. All your traffic goes through the secure VPN tunnel. Your IP address hidden, nobody knows it. Your data is encrypted, they can't touch it. Watch shows and movies on streaming services that are on in other countries, but not on in here. For instance, I watch British shows on a certain server. I won't say which one, I don't know if I'm supposed to, but uh, like Doctor Who in England, you can't see it here. I can see it for free on uh, through this, through, my, through uh, the streaming service that usually blocks them. Brooklyn Nine-Nine, I'm obsessed with 24, binging that right now. Can't see it on the server, on the uh, streaming service here. PIA works on whatever platform you have, iOS, Android, whatever. You only need one subscription to cover 10 devices at the same time. 30-day money-back guarantee, privateinternetaccess.com slash Fitzdog. Only by using this link can you guys get complete digital privacy for less than $3 a month and get three extra months for free by using this code privateinternetaccess.com slash Fitzdog. Dig it. Support the show. Support the sponsors. Love us. Football season's here, baby. Oh, yeah. It's exciting. First week. I got involved with uh, a little betting. My bookie is the way to go. Um, winning season returns at my bookie. It means they'll double your first deposit. I know. Sounds crazy, but they're doing it. They did it for me, and I didn't sign. And I, I didn't, they didn't do me any favors. It, they'll do it for you. Uh, winning season means Survivor, Super Contest, Squares, all all the ones you love. It's time to celebrate this NFL season with some extra cash in your pocket. Sign up now and get your first deposit match, dollar for dollar, all the way up to one thousand um, dollars. Yeah. While you're at it, grab yourself an entry into the famed My Bookie Super Contest. What is the Super Contest? How do you play? Simple. All you have to do is pick up, pick five NFL games against the spread each week and have a chance at a hundred grand guaranteed cash prize. Best part is My Bookie has thousands of bets to choose from over the full NFL slate and NBA playoffs, from live betting to championship futures. Every play you want to make is waiting for you. At my bookie, make your picks, win big, collect your cash. Mybookie.com. Use promo code Fitzdog, F-I-T-Z-D-O-G, and double your first deposit now. This is no brainer. Your winning season begins today. Only at mybookie.com. Promo code Fitzdog. Get involved. It's fun. It's fun to gamble. Okay, here's the show. Before we get to Steve-O, my guest today, let's do a quick say what? Say what? This is a, I thought I'd do an addition. I thought I'd do a theme. Mm. Today's theme is grandmas. Th things that your grandma said, but they're grandmas of three different races. Get a taste of these different races. Can we be race, can, can we not be racist, but still do this? Let's see, Greg. Let's, let's try, Fitz Dog. Hey, Fitzdog, here's a saying my Irish grandma would say when we'd drive by a cemetery and a funeral was happening. She'd say, quote, today is their sorrow, tomorrow is ours. Jesus, how often did that happen? Where were you guys driving? What was, what was your route? What was your route to church with grandma? Hey, let's take this shortcut through uh, St. Helena's uh, Cemetery. Maybe we'll see a funeral happening, Grandma, and you can say that weird thing you always say. That's so Irish. Always looking for the tragedy. Always looking. You can, you know, you see the funeral. Hey, you can acknowledge it. You can go, I'm sorry for their loss. You don't have to say, that's us. That's us pretty soon, kids. Probably going to be me. All right. Enjoy the ride. 
She was the first generation from Ireland. Millicent Adsit. I don't know what that means. We were lucky to have her for 101 years. Irish broads, you can't kill them. You can't kill them. You go down to Florida, It's my, my mom is a perfect example. It's all old Irish women whose husbands died. They outlast them. They fucking outlast them. Thai women, they die young, the Thai women. I'm kidding. They look young when they die. That's why you think they die young. They don't age. This one comes from Peter Squires. I thought of some quips my Jewish grandma used to say, quote, you don't really know someone until they show you their ass. Yeah, that is very true. That is literally in the wild. That is how people meet. That is how a female meets a male. She presents. She leans forward, pulls her, pulls her ass up in the air, and she presents. That's how you know somebody. Or like, you know, you have a one night stand with somebody and then you got to get up and walk to the bathroom from the bed after the one night stand. You barely know what their face looks like. Now they're staring at your naked ass. Well, because nobody in in real life, nobody takes the sheet and wraps it around them like they do in those PG-13 movies, like Twilight. Now they see your ass. Nobody wants to see that. She's walking to the bathroom. She's got cum dripping down her calf. I don't want to see that. Stay in there. I'm going to head out. This is from Ryan Guzak. My grandma was Czech. If you were wearing a hat at the dinner table, she'd say, take off your hat or you will marry a crazy woman. That's solid advice. I used to argue with her and keep my baseball hat on at the table. God, was she ever right. My wife could be on a bipolar medication commercial. Well, Peter, hope your wife listens to Fitz Dog Radio because she's going to go fucking crazy. If she's bipolar, I can guess which direction she's going to go in. It's not the happy one. When she hears this, she's going to go berserk. Good luck with that. All right, I had some overheards, but we're time's, time's a waste. And I want to get to Steve-O because I had such a great time talking. I didn't know how it would go. I've never met Steve-O. I'd, I'd heard crazy things about him, you know, from working the same clubs as him. He's a maniac. Obviously, I watched Jackass over the years. But you know what? Perfect guest. What do I want? A perfect guest. I want a madman, a mad woman. I want someone who's wild. I want someone, more importantly, who's honest, who's vulnerable and funny and available to do the podcast. Is clutch. Anyway, he was available. I got him. I was psyched. Turned out great. Here's my, uh, here's my conversation with Steve L. Welcome to Fitz Dog Radio. I'm sitting here in Fitz Dog Studios, Venice Beach, California, home to people not unlike my guest today, freaks, lunatics, uh, people living on the end of self-destruction and self-love. And when I say self-love, I mean chronic masturbation. Steve-O. <laughs> Good to yeah, see you. Good to see you and Wendy. Wendy, the Peruvian street dog. Yep. That's correct, man. She's a real star, dude. It's so upsetting to me that for all of the lengths that I've gone to to seek attention, all of the things I've done to my body, and the most viewed piece of content that I have ever put online was a video of me finding this dog in the streets of Peru. I mean, it, it got over 100 million views on Facebook. This dog's no a bona fide shit. celebrity. Does she have her own Twitter yeah. account? I know Rogan's dog has a Twitter account or an Instagram account. Yeah. Not, uh, I think I don't know about Twitter, yeah. but I know Instagram. And yes, she does. She, she is Wendy from Peru on Instagram. And she's got over a quarter million followers That's amazing. on there. Amazing. And uh, she looks like she can hear yeah. from a mile away. Look at those fucking ears, man. Yeah. They say that they say they're dingo ears. Um, but yeah, so she's one of four dogs that I have at home yeah. with my fiance. We also have two cats 
and in our backyard, oh, three nice. goats. Which I'm, yeah, I'm really thrilled about that. We built a little barn for the for them at night, and uh, they, they roam around in the back during now, the day. Now, do you have to milk a goat? You don't have to milk a goat, I don't think. Uh, they're all male goats. They're dwarf goats. Uh, so perhaps other types of goats you do, but I, I, right. I just don't know. Yeah, if you're milking a male goat, I don't yeah. think that's milking. I, I think that's something <laughs> else. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think. Uh, I think they're fixed too, I, if I'm if I'm Speaking correct. of fixed, are you? I mean, you must... Uh, now, did I you am. get did you get the operation, or you just think you've been kicked in the ball so many times that you can't produce sperm? You know, I, I love the question, man. Um, and I just didn't want to have kids, and neither does yeah. my fiance. So I, I, I went ahead and I scratched this item off my bucket list, which was a stunt I called the vasectomy Olympics, <laughs> and. Uh, before going to get the vasectomy procedure, I absolutely had to go get a sperm count. You know, I went to like a, yeah. a fertility clinic and, uh, and I, I rubbed one out um, just because I'd been asked so often if I could even have kids after all the right. testicular trauma that I've received. And um, God, I'm so proud of this, dude. The average man has uh, 20 to 30 million sperm per milliliter of jizz. And I clocked in at a whopping 51 no million. Oh shit, so it actually helps. Yeah. I mean, the, the old adage, if it doesn't kill you, it makes That's you amazing. stronger. In this case, yeah, it uh, seems to be real evidence that um, my pullout game yeah, was I was gonna strong. say, like, how many girls did you knock <laughs> up with that super sperm over the years? I, I never, I, I never snuck one past the goalie that I'm aware That's of. That's sick. And when you, when you gave the sperm sample, did they give you uh, AIDS? Were there magazines, video? Cause I hear about places where they have videos you can watch. There was, there absolutely was. There was a little library, a whole shelf of, of, uh, do you of remember DVDs. what you went for? Um, well, I was uh, being timed. Actually, uh, <laughs> I, I raced my buddy. We both got we, we both uh, got a sperm count, so I didn't even bother. I didn't even bother putting anything in. I just worked with wow. the cover itself. Wow, freestyle, <laughs> old school. Yeah, yeah. I just uh, I worked with the cover, and I believe I clocked in at under two You're minutes. You're something else, Steve-O. I got to tell you, I. I think I, I don't <laughs> know how fast I could come because every time I can, I always like take a victory lap before I do. Like I know I'm on the edge and then I go, fuck this. This is fun. Let me let me step back for a second and then yeah. step back in again. In the world of sex addiction, that's called oh, edging, really? I believe. Edging. You just want to get to the edge and then you pull yeah. it back. And that's how people, <clears throat> certain people can really pour like 10 hours of their day into that. It becomes uh, very uh, destructive to one's um, Yeah, do you think life. that because, you know, I think about masturbation, maybe because I'm Irish Catholic, I don't know how you grew up, but like there's a lot of shame with masturbation. And I would even say in coming, there is, there really is like a postpartum depression when I masturbate that keeps me from getting shit done. Huh. Um, I don't know that it's ever kept me from getting anything done. And I think that predominantly I've timed it as a, right. a sleep aid, you know, and uh, it's been very effective in that regard. But, um, you know, I, uh, yeah, I just, um, I, I, I'm really blessed to have taken on the whole, you know, sexual sobriety deal. You know, and uh, it, it, was, it was a thing, man. I, I, I aspired to be a real scumbag for my childhood, my formative years. You know, I really just was a scumbag. And uh, it came to a time where I just recognized that I was on a path of, you know, becoming pretty pathetic and depressing, you know, trying to 
act out sexually all the time. And, and I subscribed to the idea that, that really being happy uh, was dependent on me learning how to have a healthy relationship. So I got into therapy and I did all this work. And now, lo and behold, I've uh, got years of sexual sobriety under my belt. Wait, and what's sexual sobriety? I'm really thrilled about it. It's uh, sexual sobriety, unlike, say, with... Uh, Alcohol and drugs. Alcohol and drugs is black and white. You, you, you can't have it. You don't have it. And then there's your sobriety time is however much right. time you have not had it. And with with uh, with sexual sobriety, one does not seek to become asexual. It's not about removing sexuality from your life. It's about uh, finding a new and healthy approach to sexuality, which does not bring about uh, shame. And, uh, you know, destruction. And is that, is that mostly to do with and, other partners um, or is that to do with the amount or what? It, it can, it, it can really be all over the place, you know, for, uh, for, for some people it's, it's purely porno and porno yes. can be so destructive to people's lives. Like I said, they'll spend yeah. 10 hours a day doing it. Um, so like the way that it works, each addict in recovery will define their own sobriety, meaning that, uh, they, you know, they, they work it out with in consultation, which behaviors are, uh, red light behaviors, meaning that, that if you, if you act out in that manner, that constitutes a relapse. And then you've got uh, yellow light behaviors, which are not a relapse, but you want to be really careful. You know, you recognize that as a danger zone. And then you've got your green light behaviors, which are healthy things that you want to. Uh, you know, Can spend I your ask time you? Doing. Is is it so too personal to ask you what what your yeah. red light behaviors are? Um, it's it's pretty straightforward for me that uh, you know any kind of sexual contact outside of my right. committed relationship. Uh, you know, basically defines it. Um, I, w I would say, I mean, I would even go further than sexual, you know, like if I'm like, if I'm in intriguing with some woman, that's not my fiance, then that's, that's not a yellow. Okay. That sounds like a yellow. You know? So I, I suppose, yeah, I suppose it'd be, it'd be a yellow, but I just don't, I don't really yeah. fuck with the yellow either, man. Like porn for me would be like, like porn for me yeah. is yellow. You know, I don't want to, um, yeah, but, but it's, it's when you're in a relationship, it's pretty simple, you know, any kind of, you know, sexual contact outside my relationship. And that sort of is an umbrella that covers it Good all. Good for you, man. I'm proud of you. That's amazing. And I love that there's fruits of that because I've been sober 21 years and I know, yeah. Wow. Thanks, man. And I. Yeah, I just turned 12 in the, in That's the beverage fantastic. program. That's great. And it is like people are always talking about what they're going to miss. You know, I get so many emails from people because I'm sober asking for advice about it. And they're, uh, a lot of times you hear people that want to hedge and they go, yeah, but what if I'm at a wedding? What if I'm out with a bunch of buddies? And I, and I just go, right. those things collectively cannot compare to a healthy marriage to waking up in the morning and being able to accomplish things, to losing all the shame that comes along with it, to fucking, to, to sure. making an ass of yourself socially where you're making phone calls the next day. Like they just, there, there is immediate rewards to the work that you put into sobriety. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, like at the end of my run with drugs and alcohol, I was, Utterly incapable of making it through a period of 24 hours without perpetrating any number of fucking things that made me feel so ashamed, so humiliated, so uh, remorseful. Just It was fucking hell, man. It was absolute fucking hell. And uh, when, when it comes down to it, I think that the, the we, you know, like you're talking about with the, the weddings, but what about one of this? I think that the larger question that people have is, but, is, but my life's right. going to be boring. You know, like what, my life's going to be boring. It's like, uh, yeah. what am I going to do for fun? And um, I think that that's really what it is, is that when the 
when, when the wreckage that you're creating on a daily basis is sufficiently hellish, like I'll take. And also, you know, that. what's boring, you know, what's boring, you know, <laughs> standing there with the same bunch of guys talking about the same <laughs> shit. And then the next day going, dude, what did sure. I do? And then they tell you, and then you tell them and you all laugh and you go to brunch. It's right. like, that's boring. A hundred percent. There's nothing boring about my life today. And, uh, I'm just so stoked about it. Then um, on top of that, once you stop, uh, you know, just if you just take the amount of time wasted, you know, sitting there, you know, getting loaded, never mind the the resources, you know, the financial resources it takes to yeah. stay loaded all the time, but just the time yeah. poured into it, you know, let alone that when you're getting loaded, spending all that time, staying loaded like that you're just going in the dead opposite direction you know making awful decisions creating all kinds of problems and uh wasting all your fucking time making mistakes and and if you stop doing that you've got all this time freed up to be largely laser focused on what it is you want to accomplish and and then when you take the layer of uh you know how much time the average guy or, or, or let's say the average comedian spends fucking trying to ch- correspond with chase down, you know, like juggle, like all this, uh, yeah. sexual acting out. It's, uh, it's, it's pretty unbelievable. And then the attendant stress of like, Oh my God, like, what have I done? You know, like, and the, and, and the, just the, the, awful self-esteem damage done by like just mistreating people you know like the the way that i was carrying on i would actually say that i was you know routinely you know i'd be infatuated with somebody i would you know pour on the charm i would get you know sort of get act out and then just lose interest you know almost like some kind of a weird sociopath and like and there's no question for me that the the, the, what drove that awful behavior was uh like just terror you know terrorizing fear of abandonment and neglect on some on some level you know like and some something to do with that you know what do you mean like in uh, other words you would you would leave them before they had a chance to abandon you i think so I think so. I think like somehow, like on a subconscious level, I would only want to like even interact with anybody who I can knew I, couldn't Can hurt I me, ask you, you do know? you think, and this I'm sure came up in therapy, but I mean, I was reading your bio and do you think it has to do with the fact that you moved around so much? Because when you were, you were born at six months old, you moved to Brazil at two years old, you moved to Venezuela. At four, you moved to Connecticut. At six, you moved to Florida. At nine, you moved to England, then Canada, and then back to England. I mean, that had to have taken a toll on you in terms of emotional commitment to people. You know, I don't, I don't think it's that. Um, God, plus, man, what a boring <laughs> bio. <laughs> <That's> a, uh, <laughs> uh, I think they, I mean, my experience of it, well, you know, moving so frequently, growing up in five different countries, my experience was that whenever my parents said, hey, you know, we're moving again, you know, I remember not being like, oh God, you know, I've just set my roots and now I got to go make new friends. It wasn't that at all. I remember thinking, fuck yeah, because like I was this like super uh, overwhelming, like attention seeking like fucking ball of energy that just did everything completely wrong i was so socially awkward and uncomfortable and it was so important to me to win over the approval and affection of my peers but everything i did to try to accomplish that brought about the opposite results. You know, I was just too much. It was just like with this fucking guy, you know? And so every time my parents said we were going to move, I was ecstatic about the idea. I was like, fuck yeah, I get a fresh new start, a a, a clean, a clean slate. Now I'm going to be fucking cool. I'm going to get it right this time. And every time, you know, we moved and there I was. <laughs> it all happened all over again. You know, it's like, it's really crazy how 
the, the what ended up working for me, you know, on a professional level in my adult life was so like awfully fucking unaffected and, and traumatic for me. In well, my it does childhood. sound like the same dynamic as wanting to conquer the next girl instead of staying with one is moving. The, the act of putting yourself in a new challenging situation that you had to sort of prove yourself in. Yeah, I, I I mean, I suppose. And it's all just a, such a mess. Plus, like my the, all the alcoholism in my family. And then on top of that, my uh, my dad was the reason why we moved so frequently and to so many different countries was because my dad was uh, a you know, pr- majorly successful corporate executive. And he, uh, you know, headed up. Uh, international divisions of American multinational corporations. Like when we moved to Brazil and I was six months old, dad was the president of Pepsi Cola in all of Brazil. And so, yeah. And, and I spoke my first words as I understand it in Portuguese living in Brazil because my, my parents had live in maids, which raised me, you know, my parents, like I spoke Portuguese because I I learned to speak from the live in maids and I think that it's it just follows that there was like a high level of neglect, not because my parents were bad people. Right, they were right. just balling. You know, the, the shit was shit was popping off. There was a lot of drinking going on. There was a lot of uh, success. There was a lot of money. And and I, there just wasn't a lot of attention paid to, uh, you know, to, to me. And, and not that that's like you know, good or was bad. That like, how was, was that like, because I hear I about that- when you go, when you get to the big wigs of these, I mean, basically it's colonialism. When you go, when you go to Central and South America and these, and these companies like Pepsi go in or oil companies or fruit companies, they're going in. And you're, like you said, they're balling. They're hanging out with the ambassadors. They're hanging out with the other big wigs. Everybody's got yeah. servants. Everybody's fuck. It's cheap to live there. So you're living like a fucking king. So what, what was your mom's social life like? Yeah. Mom was uh, like the, I mean, dad was like just the, the hard worker, you know, and, and he was, uh, like the the black sheep of the family for going into business the way he did. He came from a, like a whole family tree right. of scholars and theologians and clergymen and, you know, nobody like university professors, no zoologists. Wow. Like it was, a, yeah, for sure. My dad's whole family tree is purely that. There's nobody with less than a PhD in the whole family. You know, it's-, it's And you uh, did one year. And his dad was a- <laughs> like, <laughs> right. Yeah, for sure. And so uh, that and, and dad wasn't like particularly uh, bubbly yeah. as a personality where my right. mom super was, you know, mom was like had this sense of humor. She was I think my mom was actually far more intelligent right. than my dad. You know, dad was just focused and a hard worker and, you know, like just right. made it happen where mom was really smart. Mom was really funny. Mom was really personable. Like uh, all of the, you know, social networking, my mom like was really the, the leader of, and uh, the thing about my mom's side of the family, a hundred percent of it is alcoholic gambling, suicide, Damn. like really fucking heavy yeah, like every single person, as I understand it, from my mom's side of the family, I used to say is dead or dying from alcoholism, but now they're wow. actually all dead. So was there <laughs> were there all, family get-togethers yeah, that it, were just insane on your mom's side? There, there weren't. There were. There was. Uh, I, I want to say that um, when I was like one or something. Uh, if I was even born yet, there was something with my, my sister or me and, uh, my mom's father like pulled a gun and pointed it at the no. baby, <laughs> you know, I don't know if that baby was me or my sister, but that was it for, uh, that was it for, you know, we didn't like, I grew up with that. There was never any interaction, uh, with my, my mom's side of the family, very little, if any at all. And, and that same grandfather who pulled the gun, he ended up shooting himself no in the head. And, uh, Damn. yeah. So the certain mom's side of the family is pretty, pretty intense. Uh, I have a cousin, I have two cousins 
and they're they're still alive. They're actually doing pretty well. My cousin, uh, my mom's side, uh, my cousin went to mortician school. He's a funeral director. And, and he was in mortician school when I was in <laughs> clown college. And my mom and her sister were getting absolutely trashed, just cracking up, arguing over whose son was a bigger loser. <laughs> And uh, my mom's sister died of cirrhosis of the liver. Uh, and, and my mom died from an, an aneurysm, which is, uh, you know, with all the cigarette smoking and the alcohol, like uh, that, that really right. ups, ups right. That, that whole thing. So it's, it's kind of crazy how having this dynamic, my, my dad's side of the family and my mom's side of the family, like it actually, I think, makes perfect sense that I turned out the way that I did. Because it's like all of the the gumption, you know, all of the the drive, like the the tenacity of my dad, just as serving as like an engine to right. fuel deviance from right. my mom's side right. of the family, you know, like he was the car uh, and she was the and, fuel. And that's how, right, and um, and so so it makes it, it all kind of like those those. I'm a hybrid of these two things, and and the title of my memoir. Uh, is professional idiot, <laughs> <laughs> which I think uh, is you know I've never even really thought of it that way as like that yeah, you know the two right. sides of my family combined. No, it's funny but, because like I yeah, I don't pretty, think you and I have ever met, have we? No, I don't think I, we I'm have. Not so sure that, that my we first have, exposure no. to you, I didn't know what to expect. I know you're a fucking madman. I read a lot of stuff about you. You seem to be somebody that has like a a thick ass bio of things that you've done and accomplished. But when I <laughs> when I emailed you yesterday about just the you know the setup at the computers and everything. You're like, well, hey, man, I can shoot at HD from four angles. If you want me to do a, a live mix, we can. And I'm like, <laughs> what the fuck, dude? Just plug in your recorder. <laughs> and I was like, wow, this guy is on it. This guy is like tech savvy. And, you know. It, yeah, it's it's pretty it's pretty crazy how, uh, you know, like I, I'm just I'm. I'm all about what I do, you know, uh, moderation has never right, been right. my, my strong suit. And, um, you know, the, like back to the whole thing of, uh, you know, sobriety on all the levels, you, you, you take away all the time that you waste making bad decisions and fucking up your life. And what you end up with, you know, by, by doing this, this thing that, that, that we do in recovery, like I now have nothing but time to be laser focused on what I want to accomplish. And I have this magnificent life partner helping me to accomplish my goals. And I've, I've got a whole team around me that I've kind of put together over the years of people who, you know, for the most part are in recovery as well. And we just, you know, it, it's, it's all, it feels like cheating at a certain point. It's like, man, like, you know, we're fucking, we're just, you know, the, the more that, that we accomplish, then we add on to it. And so there's just levels of like, of, uh, of things. So now it's like, yeah, for sure. You want to record something like yeah, how many angles that's you great. want, you know, that's great. like, no, it <laughs> is, um, you know, I think, I think it, this business is so it's, it's great that you've sort of like moved as the, as the business has. I mean, it used to be something that, you know, you had to be on TV all the time and you, and you've certainly done enough TV shows and movies, but right now and uh, exacerbated by the pandemic is that you need to be doing what we're doing right now and put, and putting out your special right. online, which you did, which is called, uh, uh, Gnarly. Gnarly. Right. Uh, you put out your special online. You've <laughs> got your podcast, Wild Ride, online. You've got um, merchandise. I saw your <laughs> I saw your face yeah. mask. It's a dude with cum in his mouth. <laughs> it was actually me. Is that you? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I fill I filled my mouth with dishwashing liquid. Finally, somebody's washing your mouth out. I don't go with anywhere soap. without it. <laughs> um, and so yeah. like the, you know, the idea uh, that you're producing your own stuff and putting it out on your own website and, oh, here we go. Here's the, here's the mask. If you're not watching this yeah. on YouTube, by the way, you're missing out on a lot. Look at that. <laughs> Holy shit. Yeah. Do you actually wear that when you're out? It's, 
You know, I, I, I keep two in my pocket. I got okay. the cartoon version, which is real PG, and then I've got the mouthful of cum version. And, uh, you know, I make the call. It, it, it doesn't even depend on where I'm going. Like, with, it, it's, it's all about right. the mood right. I'm in. <laughs> you know, sometimes I'll be going into the gas station and I'll think, man, I'm just, I just, yeah. Yeah. I, can't, I can't do it. <laughs> I can't do it with the cum. And, and other times, like, you know, I'll just feel, yeah, I'll yeah, be yeah. feeling it. <laughs> That's great. I always find that, like, in my life, I've, I've always been kind of, I'm crazy too. Like I had my drinking years and I'm definitely was the kid who would hang off the sixth floor balcony by my knees. I would do flips into fucking, you know, off of rocks into rivers. And I got into a lot of fist fights, but at the same time, like I always dressed normal. I always felt like jeans, t-shirt, khakis buttoned down. I was like, that's not me. I'm not going to be the guy that's like making a fashion statement. But then once in a while, when I wear like something like a mask with cum coming out of my mouth, I go, wow, I'm having a more fun day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's, uh, I forget how it even came up, but, uh, but I just, I just thought somebody has got to have yeah. made a mask like, you know, and, and I don't know that they did. Yeah. I think I beat everybody right. to it. <laughs> um so you yeah so dude th thank you for uh for for bringing up my the special i just put out man god I, i'm i'm so so stoked on it and um and okay so i just want to kind of tell you how, how this happened because i'm so filled with fucking resentment i just got to be honest i fucking I, I have resentment around this um see i got into stand-up First time I tried stand up comedy was 2006, so 14 years ago. Had no plan to try it. I, somebody asked me to do a stunt at the comedy club. And, and I was like, yeah, sure. I was all loaded and I showed up. And I, it just, the, the harebrained idea I had, I was like, dude, there's no stunt I could do in the comedy club that would be crazier right, than right. trying stand up, you know? And like, so I, 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 was, I was waiting for my turn to get on stage and and I was trying to think, like, if I was going to just try and say something, make people, make people laugh, like, I ended up getting on stage. I said, hey, everybody, I'm in the mood for a blowjob. Does anybody <laughs> want one? And I got a huge laugh. Yeah. You know, it was my first joke yeah. I ever told on stage. I'm a huge laugh, whatever. It was like, you know, the feeling that I had when I got on that stage. I remember this was uh, 2006 that people were excited to see me. They knew me from Jackass. Like there was like, they're just there to have a good time. You know, they were excited to see me. They were rooting for me. They wanted to fucking have fun. And, and it was just right. like, I felt like they were on my side. I remember like as loaded as I was, I was like, dude, I got to do this because what drives me in everything that I do is, is what an attention yeah. whore I am. So it doesn't matter if I'm shoving something up my ass on jackass, if I'm, you know, talking into a microphone in a comedy club, yeah. it's the same thing. You know, it's just look at me, look at me, please fucking, you know, let, and, that, let and, me that, and you've had that since you, know, you were like, five years old. Oh, yeah. I was younger. Wow. <laughs> way, way younger than that. Um, and so, so this, so the motivation for me to be doing stand up is clear. There's no, there's no fucking mystery about that. And, um, you know, I, I, came back to the comedy club a couple of times and really didn't do well where I bombed and it traumatized me. And so I didn't even fucking go near the comedy club until I'd been sober for a while. And once I got sober, then I really dove into it in earnest and I started touring in 2010. So I've been a touring fucking headliner on the comedy club circuit for a full 10 years. And I've really I've given yeah. a fuck about it. You know, like I've worked at it. I I keep coming around. There's something that's been been working about it because I keep going around the circuit and going back and and actually the right. the business grows. When uh when you know when I started Jackass 3D was in theaters, having just been number one at the box office, and nobody wanted to see Steve O at the comedy club. <laughs> you know, I mean, not nobody, but it was like, all right. And it's crazy. Wait, why to would they not? I would think that that would make people want to see you more. It was just that Steve O doing stand up. You know, I was like, oh, oh okay. well, I know the guy is, right, right. you know, the jackass guy, but like, am I really going to go see him at the comedy right. club perform stand up? 
you know, and so it, it represented a little bit of, uh, of an uphill battle, a lot of an uphill battle, you know, in one sense I had the, uh, you know, I had the built in fan base, but you know, it was, yeah. I was crossing over and, um, you know, and, and, and I viewed it at the time as like, okay, I did that. And now I'm doing this totally separate. And, and I'm going to establish myself as a community and I don't give a fuck what anybody says. I'm going to work at it. I'm going to keep going. I'm going to, I'm, I'm going to make it happen. And I ended up, uh, getting a, a special on Showtime, my first stand up special. And, uh, for where I was at the time, it was, uh, couldn't have come out any better, you know, like it was, it, it was, you know, it was what it was. I fucking was thrilled with how it came out. Like I said, for where I was at the time. Now what happened though, is that that special came and went and I was so sure that, that, that everybody would be shut the fuck up. I would now be respected, established. Steve-O got a comedy special. He's been fucking yeah, embraced right, by right, the right, world, right. <laughs> you know? And my life did no, not change in the no. tiniest fucking way. It didn't change even a little bit, but I didn't let that bother me. I just said, all right, well, fuck it. I'm keeping going. I'm done, you know, I'm just gonna stick at it. And what happened was that as I put together the subsequent hour, you know, like still touring on the comedy club, I have enough, I had enough time before the special came out that I could lean on that material right. while building some new material. And I just kept going. And as I was putting together the new hour one night while I was performing on stage, it was like my fucking head exploded with this idea. I thought, Oh shit. You know, I'm telling these crazy stories these absurd, implausible fucking stories, which are a hundred percent true. And that's kind of been my angle on, on, on my standup from the start. But in the case of this new hour I was putting together, it, it struck me that virtually everything I was describing in the act had actually right. happened on camera. So then I thought, Oh my God, what if I, what if I make of a course, multimedia comedy special where I edit the footage of the stories in like, I, right. I'd never heard of that. I was like, dude, the the world's first multimedia fucking yeah. comedy special that's just so over the top and the footage is just backing up right. every absurd joke, you know, like, and dude, I got, I got so excited about it. I started recording my shows and watching them and this, if I have a regret for over the years, for those first like five, five six years, it's that. I, I, I think a lot of comics do this. I, I recoiled at the idea of watching myself perform stand-up comedy. I couldn't watch footage yeah. of it. It just made me uncomfortable. Right. I didn't want to see it. And that was recklessly irresponsible. That's the Straight first, up, that's the like first advice I give to new comics. I say, audio tape every set yeah. you do and sit down the next morning with a notepad and take notes and notice... Did I change the words, which got a better laugh? Is there a sentence I can take out? You'll think of taglines as you go. Right. Like that is the, you will cut years off your progress if you watch yourself. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I would even take it a step further and make sure that it's not right. just audio, but video. You know, because there's right, mannerisms, right. there's this, there's so much, you know, there's like, you know, like this swaying yeah. and shit, you know, like all this like little things. And, um, you know, I did myself a major disservice by not studying the tape of the performances. You know, it made me uncomfortable. I didn't want to do it. I didn't do it. And therein, I fucking I think it's the same time. thing. Jenna but James said the, the idea, same thing about uh, her early porn work. And if she could have looked, she could have seen <laughs> that the double, the double anal with the turnaround <laughs> with her head, the way she cocked her head would allow her to take. <laughs> right always room I for growth completely <laughs> for sure and and once once i got the idea to cut the footage into the act then now and i was so excited about it i started taping my shows and i bring it into the computer and now like i'm i'm lining up the footage i'm, I'm editing it all together and that forced me right to study the tape you know and and, and so in for the for the first thing was just the fact that it worked you know what i what i pictured fucking worked and it worked beautifully well and then i i, I studied the and just there were certain things that just drive me fucking crazy and and for good reason and i just would i was still out on tour i just kept doing shows and i would address those things and the progress was sped up so dramatically that the growth you know when it 
the growth was just way fucking faster. And then I became a little bit kind of like, just it irked me that like it, that the whole project felt so much like just regaling my my crazy history right, living right, in right. the past you know like and i was just like dude was, am i gonna spend the rest of my fucking life living in the past fuck that you know and so i just i became really like i urgently wanted to just fucking plug in new things so i let each bit in the act inspire some completely brand new some completely not fucking safe for youtube like some just explicit over the top fucked up shit to plug in and so it's like the bit and then the new bit that that inspires and then the bit and then Every bit inspiring right, right. something fresh and new. And it just, everything was working so well. And then for the opening sequence, I came up with the idea to have the, the entire Jackass cast. And this was a big deal because they were, they weren't really like in the beginning, super on board with me doing the comedy. It was like, all right, right with your right. stand up, you know, like not that they, not that they didn't, not that they don't love me. They totally love me, but it was just like, oh, you know, all right. Like, I, you know, and, uh, then for this one, where I was at for, for this new special, not only did they all get together, which happened to be for the first time in years, but this beautiful symbolic opening sequence where I got this uh, billboard truck. Uh, I rented a billboard truck, like the kind yeah. that drives around Vegas, you know, and, and I had it. The billboard was like promoting the actual special, this new one called Gnarly and the whole cast of Jackass together for the first time in years, man. The first time we had all been together on camera since we lost Ryan Dunn and all the guys, Knoxville, bam, everybody, they duct tape me to the side <laughs> of this billboard I truck remember that. and fucking yeah. whack baseballs. Yeah, Knoxville's whacking baseballs at me like fucking yeah. way too hard. And then like and, and then kind of symbolically they see me off, send me off in the trucks driving down the fucking highway with me duct taped to it to get me to the theater, which was in Denver. You know, like I put more more work into this opening sequence, getting all the shots fucking to Vegas. Through the mountains, the snow, fucking like all duct taped to the side of the truck to get to the theater to do this, this, this special. And on top of having all the footage edited in, they, the, the, the Jackass guys came oh, out to amazing. Denver too. That's so, so they cool. Came out, yeah, they came out intermittently throughout the show on stage to perform fucking over the top stunts Sick. before the live audience, you know, and everything just worked so well. So like... I mean, dude, I was just, I, it, it all came together in such a, just a spectacular fashion. Plus I spent like over a quarter million dollars no just producing shit, the damn really? Thing. You know, like, with, because, the, because, well, yeah, because there were so and this many was shoots. All, it wasn't, and the business it wasn't model just in the is, theater. It's, it's only available on your website for, for uh, whatever it is, 999. Right. St for, yeah, for streaming. Have you made yeah, your money back? Uh-huh. Well, I, I, I did, but, but, but this, here's the thing. This is why I said I was so filled with resentment, right? And which is a dangerous thing for, for right. alcoholics we know, but I can't, I just can't fucking help it. I taped that damn special in January of 2018. I fucking sat on it for two and a half years. I was so sure that this thing was, was, uh, so special, man. You know, and it is. It is with the growth in in the stand up, with the the stand up being illustrated by fucking all this crazy footage, all the jackass guys, the way everything worked, all the crazy new shit. I got fucking skin grafts on fifteen percent of my body for the closer. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like I blew up my whole living room with me in it and got third degree burns all over me, and I was I didn't even care, man. And, uh, and then I'd take the thing after spending all that fucking money, making it my baby. And the only, the, the only places that could have bought it are the play. Cause it was, it's loaded yeah. with dicks. You know, there's a lot of my dick in there. There's a lot of fucking hardcore drug abuse. There's a lot of grievous bodily harm. There's a lot of fucking yeah. criminal activity. It's not going right. on comedy central, but like, but all the places that could have shown all that shit fucking right. 
passed on it. They just straight right. up, they rejected it. And not because it wasn't fucking good. The right. shit's fucking good. The thing was, though, that they just weren't willing to get into the business of Steve-O doing stand-up comedy. You know, like since I did my first special, the, 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 Comedy, stand-up comedy is just such a fucking saturated thing. Like specials are coming out, and so they want to. They want like that fucking prestigious comedian to no, get these specials. They're, they're like, giving out these 50, 50 million dollar, eighty million dollar contracts to Seinfeld and Chris Rock and Chappelle. And then guys like us, and uh, you know, you have way more of a hook than I do, but like straight white men. Right now, unless you're selling out arenas, they're not interested. And so I think it's great that what you did was you put it out yourself. And at the end of the day, the people that follow you and love you are going to watch that special. They're going to talk about it. And then it's something that will have legs. It's like if you put it on Showtime or, you know, HBO, whatever. It's gonna run a half a dozen times, an and then they're not date. gonna play it again. Your yours is gonna be playing forever, and you're right. gonna, you know, when you're gonna be fucking seventy years old, assuming you live that long, which is probably not likely, and you'll <laughs> still your 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 wife will be getting the residuals. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, dude, I I was so hurt, man. I was so hurt because yeah. this fucking thing was so good, you know. And what watching. Uh, the, the HBO series about uh, Dr. Dre yeah, yeah. and Jimmy Iovine and, and, and hearing Dr. Dre say that when he when he fucking made the chronic, he brought the chronic to every record label and uh, and every record label rejected yeah. the chronic. And I think that's why he started his right. aftermath label. And that yeah, fucking right, worked out right, right, right for him, no. <laughs> you know. And so I, I think it's actually a real blessing for me. And by the way, Gnarly is available right now at Stevo.com. And, uh, you know, the, the, the business of it, <clears throat> by the time I got it out, there was like a hiring anti-piracy, this, this, uh, this company that the movie studios, to, 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 to just try to make it difficult right, for right. people to steal this shit. You know, to make it difficult. If, if they really fucking want it, they're gonna. And like, who cares? If you don't have 10 bucks... To, to help me extend my middle finger to that fuck face at Netflix, <laughs> then go ahead and fucking do the work to find yeah, it and find right, some right, way to right. play. I don't care, you know? But, I, boy, would I love it if people just got behind me and actually just, just ordered it through my website, you know? And um, so that's how, and I promoted it with my, my social media and this and that. And the, the anti-piracy was like, uh, it was only like six grand, you know, but, um, yeah, I paid six grand for that. I hired a publicist to, to get, you know, to, to book, to try to promote it. There was like the sound mixing, which I did two and a half years yeah. later. I had to pay for that. Like, you know, like there were, there was just expenses and expenses, you know, to coming up. And then, so I, so I thought, you know what? Those fucking fuck faces who rejected this yeah. fuck, you know, yeah. those fucking assholes. I, I was like, this is a, so I came up with the fucking, this billboard thing is actually my editor. I had the idea years ago and I just fucking spaced it. My, my editor, he's like, dude, you should get a billboard and duct tape yourself to the billboard yeah. in the middle of Hollywood. Yeah. And I'm like, fuck yeah. I'm like, fuck yeah. So I picked this billboard that's that's got the Hollywood sign immediately behind it. I mean, it's just, I'm like, yeah. it's, that's the one, dude. Fucking cost, it cost eight grand yeah. to rent that thing. And uh, so then I hired a fucking construction crew that builds like big gas stations. They, they, we showed up with fucking, with two cranes. You know, I got, I rented two fucking cranes. Like, like the, they're called cherry pickers. So you see like the, yeah, I know the, a cherry the, picker, the fucking sure, yeah. telephone company guys up yeah. there and the, with the tele. Yeah. So, you know, we got the, they built me a fucking huge metal shelf cause we didn't want to damage the billboard. So we got, we got it suspended by these straps that are rated for over 5,000 yeah. pounds of weight. They fucking duct tape me on there. The whole thing and i'm just like you know if, if i'm gonna get in trouble i don't fucking care because i want fucking those fuck faces who, who fucking rejected my special yeah. this baby this fucking beautiful thing i want them to know about it dude so i did this billboard stunt i'm guessing that you that you heard of course. about it yeah because... you got arrested for it didn't you <laughs> or they didn't they I find didn't. you or they something they didn't even charge me with anything 
Oh. They didn't find me. No. And because they didn't find me and because the way it went down yesterday, I donated $50,000 to the the Los Angeles Fire Department oh, nice. Foundation. Nice. You know, be, because it was like, you know, I like, dude, I was totally prepared to get in serious trouble for it. You know, like I didn't, I thought that by, by the virtue of the fact that, that we kept our cherry picker cranes on the scene, ready to get me down at a moment's notice with the whole construction right. team standing by to, to immediately tell each first responder that we do not right. need any help. This is totally professionally rigged. Like we don't want to waste any city resources and you know, thanks, right. but we got this. We're all good. But the fire department said that they actually had to get me down for liability reasons. So they got their big fire truck with the ladder. And I'm just thinking, oh God, I don't like this, man. I don't want, I didn't want to fucking waste city resources. And because the fire department got involved, I, I did a little fundraising thing and matched all oh, that's the amazing. 25 grand I raised and and put together 50 grand just to, to yeah, make, yeah. make me feel better about it. And I didn't even care because having spent, by the time I was on that billboard, like a good 300 grand on this project. Like I fucking already had it back. I already got it back from, from uh, having promoted the special through my social media That's for amazing. like three weeks. That's amazing. I was already in, and, and, and it was two and a half years ago that I fucking over two and a half years ago that I had already spent all the, that money yeah. was so long gone yeah. that I put into the budget. I didn't even right. feel like it was missing anymore. You know, I was like, anything I get from this is just bonus. It's gravy because this just turned into such a colossal. Yeah, but what a gift! Nightmare. What a, what a and gift! I got it all though, back. Sometimes when you get overlooked, and and it's our own shit. I mean, the head of the head of Netflix, whatever. Yeah. He's got his agenda. He's answering to some other muckety muck. It's, whatever. Right. We take it personal, but that's a gift because if you piss me off. And then whatever it is inside of you, <laughs> right. it's a it, you have you have a number of different responses to that, and yours is to say, "I'm going to show this guy." And without without that rejection, yeah. you wouldn't have put yourself into everything you've done. And I think the key the I think the key right. is is now that this this is a victory, which it quantifiably is a victory. Not only if you've just broken even, when you go on the road next. Your numbers are going to blow up. You're going to start working theaters instead of clubs. You're going to start. I already made the graduation. Well, then dude. you're going to play bigger. Got, you're going to play bigger theaters. I, I, so I, I mean, it's it, it it will just right. keep paying but you then, back. But the key is you got to take that victory, Steve. You got to take it in and let go of the well, resentment you, part because that got you here. But you don't need to hold yeah, on to it sure. anymore. You're right. Hey, I, I appreciate that. And, and on so many levels, thank you. And, 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 and here, look, look what a douche I'm. I made the graduation. The thing was that uh, two, two big things happened right before the pandemic shut down. Uh, we started filming, if you can believe this, Jackass 4, right? Like I'm 46. Some of the, a couple of the guys are already 50 and we're going to make Jackass 4. Like, it makes perfect sense for me because I never stopped doing all that shit. You know, I was like, Hey man, I'm going to be, I'm going to be doing it. Yeah. Jackass or no jackass. Right. So fucking I'm in. But, uh, you know, there were a lot of question marks around whether it made sense for us to be doing that. And, uh, and we were able, we got into production for just one week. And in that one week, it became very evident that the chemistry was nice. still there. It was still working. And what what we shot in that one week made us uh, a real priority for Paramount. They, they, they said, yeah. okay, we see it. We get it. You know, this is uh, – so so it's a saving grace that we got that one week to prove ourselves so that we can right. kind of matter when, it, when the, light, when the right. world starts rotating again. And while we were on the set for that one week – I got the call from my agent and he said, Hey dude, I just want to tell you that, uh, you know, that like you're selling, your, you're selling out your comedy clubs far enough in advance that it doesn't make sense to me to entertain any more comedy club offers. Like the, the leap to theaters having, you know, it's such a leap. There's such a fucking purgatory in between that, the, you know, and I've never been able to make the leap. He said, congratulations, we're going to do theaters. But then, yeah. but then the next week, yeah. so <laughs> the next week, everything got shut down. And, uh, and I was like, all right, cool, man. Let's fucking go with the wild ride podcast. Yeah. Let's go with the, you know, it's, uh. So it's, yeah, no, it's I've all talked good, to man. I've talked to it's a few good, comics dude. that are in the same spot as you, where they just had a phenomenal year. They were just stepping up, 
and then this happens. But you know, you take that same energy, and now when did you start the podcast? You're sitting in a you're sitting in a, a van, a Winnebago. What what is it? What are you sitting in? It's a it's a Class B motorhome built on a Dodge Ram uh, Sprinter van kind of deal, Dodge Ram Promaster. And, uh, you know, I I was working on the podcast idea for, for a couple of years, you know, um, I, I resisted doing it for the longest time because personally I found it like annoying, like when so many people, will you you do my podcast, you know, knowing full well that they don't have like a big fucking audience and, you know, like just like, it was just an annoying thing. And and I felt that way. So the idea of me turning around and starting my own podcast felt like not only hypocritical, but you know, like now, but now I just dreaded it. Like, like before we started recording, you said, dude, recording the podcast is a blast, but booking it a nightmare. And like the idea of, will, will you do my podcast? And like uh, uttering those words was so yeah. foul to me. The only way I could even wrap my head around going for it was to structure it so that my studio was on wheels. And I could, I could I, I say at the very least, wherever, whenever is most convenient for you, I can bring the studio. We'll be recording, sit down, boom, we're in, we're out, we're done and make it more convenient. And so that's how, the wild ride concept I love it. was born. And I had, I had three episodes in the can before the, the <laughs> shutdown. And so the timing yeah, was really yeah. pretty good, you know? So, and I do love it, man. I, 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 I genuinely yeah. love podcasting, man. I, I've now put up, uh, what's my net the, this week? I think, uh, my 22nd nice. episode goes up. Have you, have you emailed anyone yeah, to dude, do it? They ghosted you. Oh my God, dude, I've got, I'm like, and thank you for saying that too. Take the victory and let go of the resentment. I think, uh, they were chewing on a foot. It's like dog chewing on a bone, man. Uh, it's great advice. And, and I appreciate you for that. I'm not going to call out anybody (laughs) who uh, hurt my feelings by not responding to a text, you know, or anything like that. It just, it's counterproductive. Um, but what I will say is that I cannot believe the good fortune that I've had in, uh, in, in some of the guests that I've been able to book, you know, like it was really fucking important to me to, to, to try so hard and the anxiety that I bring on to myself with this pressure to get like really Im- yeah. impressive guests, you know, because I believe there's going to be like a, a critical mass, you know, a tipping point where you've gotten enough huge, impressive guests that, like now they start well, coming. Well, I think you got you know? that. You got uh, you and, had Shaq uh, on, man. I was jealous of that. I've always, I've always wanted. To, she's on my short list yeah. of people I'd like to get. No pun intended. Oh, dude, Shit, like <laughs> yeah, it's Shaq, Demi Lovato. What was Lovato, Shaq like? You did it on, over fucking, Zoom. Did, yeah, we did it over Zoom. If yeah, only I could have yeah. had him sitting in the van. Did you know oh, him my before? God, dude, yeah, it sucks. We worked okay. with them on Jackass uh, it, back in 2001, like in the infancy right, of the right. TV show. Um, and, uh, you know, I'd had a couple experiences with him. It was so exciting for me to tell Shaq how during his rookie year in 1993, I was uh, in the middle of my brief stint at the University of Miami in the dorms having sex with my girlfriend. The TV was behind me, and I heard on like Sports Center or whatever it was at that time, the Shack attack. Shack shatters the fucking yeah, yeah. backboard, and I just, I just couldn't help it. <laughs> I stopped having sex. I turned around <laughs> and turned my attention to the TV, and that was my first experience with the wrath of a pissed off woman. <laughs> You'd rather. Yeah, yeah, I wonder if she thought that you were into maybe you were into basketball players more than her. I don't think that's what it was, but, uh, you know, who didn't want to see fucking Shaq destroy a backboard? That's amazing. (laughs) Um, so are you, uh, I wanted to, have have you seen baskets by the way, because it's one of my favorite TV shows and it's about a guy going to clown college. And I saw that you would go into clown college. It, I did go to clown college. I haven't seen baskets and there's no, I have no explanation or excuse for why I haven't. It's Zach Alphanakis, um, who's just the greatest. I, the only, right. 
Right. I, you know, the only, uh, I think that as a consumer of content and, and, and by no means do, uh, do I avoid like Netflix or anybody, any platform that rejected my shit. Like I love good quality content. And the only person who hurt my feelings at Netflix was the guy in charge right, of buying right, comedy right. specials, <laughs> you know, like as an organization, there are so many arms, so many branches, Netflix. I love my Netflix. And what I tend to consume is, uh, nonfiction. Yeah. You know, I just kind of feel like the, the, that the, there's so much to know about the world. There's so much uh, yeah. interesting shit that I'll never even get around to, to learning or finding out. Like it, it seems a little bit odd to put a lot of time into studying shit that never happened. I know that's kind of your <laughs> yeah. life. Your version but, of entertainment is this is real. It's like it's like what you're talking about in your stand up. Right. You don't lie. It's like you don't you don't make up things that didn't happen. Right. And so you want to? Yeah, I can I can see that. I have that prejudice and, uh, you know, it, I, I used to have like a, a firm fucking rule that like I, that I just a, a full fiction boycott on all levels, you know, like yeah. no scripted, right. nothing. I don't fuck with it. Um, you know, like a biopic, yeah, I'll yeah. go there, right. <laughs> you know, but, uh, but yeah, I lifted the ban on fiction and there are a lot, there are a, a number of things I've really enjoyed and I'm sure the baskets would be one of them. And, and, uh, yeah, check it out. Yeah, um, when you did, I want to ask you about Eric Andre, cause that was fucking great. How, how uh, prepared for you for what was going to happen were you when you went on Eric Andre? Had you seen the show? Did you know that the studio was going to be 103 degrees? Like, how ready were you for that? I don't even remember that the studio being okay. particularly hot. Yeah. Was that the I, case on all the episodes? My, uh... They crank the heat just to fuck with people. Yeah. Oh, oh yeah. shit. I didn't even notice. You know, I, I didn't even notice that. And, um, uh, I. I feel like I knew him. I can't remember how we met, but uh, we had some kind of a relationship at that point. And um, there was like a pre-interview where I think I somehow randomly brought up, uh, you know, the the cost of gold, the uh, fundamental flaws with the, you know, the structure of the American economy and how it's a, a virtual Ponzi scheme just propped up on, on shit that doesn't even fucking exist. And, and, and why I'm a big fan yeah. of buying gold. Um, and then they got a kick out of that. And there was a, a plan for that to be a part of the interview. The interview, like as it happened was considerably more wide ranging and, uh, you know, at the end of the day, they went just with the bit of me right, ranting right. about gold. And by the way, I lost my ass in gold, man. I've never done well with investments. No, because gold doesn't you know? make sense. It I used, it used to be broken. that it was a hedge for the stock market, but then um, it stopped being that. And now all of a sudden, a, like, gold has been going up as the stock market's been going up. It's not a hedge for the stock market. What it is is a inflation, hedge for right. inflation. You know, like it's because, uh, you know, when, like the more money they pump into the to the fucking economy with all the quantitative easing, you know, like they, they with the with the money printing, you know, like as soon as you take the dollar off the gold standard in like 1972 or whatever you did, right. now there's nothing backing it up. And the more you print it, the more you print right. it, the less it's worth. But the thing is that you can't print more gold so it keeps its value while the dollar inflates the dollar becomes less valuable it just follows that gold keeps its value and so it's a hedge against the the ultimate fucking collapse i read that dollar. silver's a really good uh, bet for it as well people are saying silver is the new gold <laughs> i lost you my did? ass on silver too a lot I, I i did man it was uh my whole first two years of uh touring you know i like I'm touring as in, in stand up. Yeah, I, I did. You know, I did reasonably. You know, I mean, I, I had no idea going into stand up that it, that the touring could yeah. be so lucrative. You know, like when you're taking, I who who knew that the comedian gets eighty yeah. percent of the door. You know, at the yeah. in the comedy club, like I I was pretty pretty fucking blown away by the amount of money that I was earning uh, doing stand up, and for those whole two first years. Uh, 2011, 2012, 
um, I was just buying gold, dude, gold and silver. And I was buying it at fucking record highs, dude. I bought it all the way up to fucking 1900 bucks an ounce <laughs> only for in 2014, the shit to fucking drop all the way yeah. back down to a thousand. So uh. I lost, I lost so much fucking money. And then when gold went down, then I fucking bought the bought the house at the totally wrong. <laughs> I timed everything so fucking badly. And uh, if I would have bought the house when I was buying the gold and the right. gold when I was buying the house, then uh, you know, not that my lifestyle would be any different whatsoever because that's just not me. But I'd have a lot Dude, more that's, in my bank that's, account. That's, that's for sure. You know, <laughs> it is funny that people try to manage their own money. It's like going to the doctor and going, "No, no, no, I got this. I got this. <laughs> I got a guy who understands money, and he takes one percent of my whole net worth every year, and he puts it in. I don't know what the fuck he does. I talk to him twice a year. He he buys this. He buys that. It's all um, it's all what you call socially conscious stocks so he'll only buy stuff that we believe in he won't buy like you know uh defense contractors he won't buy uh tobacco companies like different things and then we invest a lot in like saving the rainforest and different different groups like that so but that dude makes me money every year he doesn't i don't fucking be, become a billionaire even 2008 2008 i i, I lost less money than other people <laughs> lost because he he had me diversified. You know, we had real estate, we had other stuff. Right. So now, you know, I got a phone call with him right. now because we got to think about what's going to happen with the election coming up. You know, is the stock market going to go one way or the other, depending on who gets elected, all that. So he'll tell me and I'll listen and he'll do it. I don't, I don't fuck with it. That's great, man. You want, yeah, you want to yeah, meet my great. guy? You want me to put I, you know, in touch with my guy? I, I, I could I could be very interested in that. Is he a he's CFA? A, he's a vice president of UBS out of Seattle. So he's Okay. And it's just you feel good about investing with him. You know that he's making as much, if not more. He rise, buys a lot of, you know, renewable energy, all the stuff that's gone through the roof over the last like ten years, he was in early on. I like the yeah. socially conscious. The socially conscious yeah. angle I dig. Because like I, I had a bunch of fucking uh Conoco, yeah. Phillips, oil. You're right. Yeah, I didn't right. feel good about and I, it. And it didn't do well. Oil Even shit in the when, bed when, the last few years. I know, but dude, I, I am a little bit kicking myself. It, it just, the fucking price of oil went yeah. to a negative number. <laughs> they're going to fucking, right. they're going to pay You're me right. for buying right. oil stocks. Like what the fuck, dude? I, I like and 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 there's my socially con <laughs> social consciousness. <laughs> I didn't fucking buy oil when it was that low. And like, yeah. Yeah, they're, they're giving the shit away, but uh, I, I do All like right. that man. I'd I'll be get interested. you on with him. He's a good man. He's a really good guy. I, I've become friends with him. So let me before I let you go because I don't want to keep you too long. Uh, that's the other thing about asking someone to do a podcast. You don't want to fucking gobble up their day. Um, you know, it's so funny. In my view, it's just like, all right, you know, like, uh, it's not even a question that I have a busy day today. Sure, there's plenty for me to do. But in my view, it's like, dude, I think this has been, uh, uh, like, there hasn't been low. The pace has been good. Fucking, like, I feel like, you know, we've, we've, uh, kept the attention of the audience like we've we've delivered a good podcast like let's fucking get right. let's get out of here before fucking that's that's why we're going out <laughs> on two yeah. different segments thanks for saying that i feel the same way i was looking forward to uh talking to you and i'm glad it came together your publicist reached out to me over uh over social media and i was like fuck yeah that was actually uh, that's so great that's actually my uh my podcast yeah. booker yeah yeah, my podcast booker who set that up. Yeah, and, uh, she's great. Dude, she's, she's a hustler, great. man. Like, yeah, I, I, I so appreciate much, that a lot. I like to so I'm, much I'm, we got on the phone together just so, so, just so we could get to know each other a little bit. Cool. You know, like the, the the deal is, I pay her for booking guests on my podcast, but I'm going to pay her for yeah, booking. Yeah, there me you on go. Yours. Yeah, throw her a little <laughs> throw her a little taste. Give her uh, give her. Yeah, uh, you bet I will, pal. I bet. Be Give her one of the cum yeah. masks. Yeah, and, and everybody listening. Yeah, everybody listening. You know, like understand that the 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 money you spend streaming my gnarly comedy special is gonna go fucking help a woman <laughs> with a child. <laughs> um, all right. <laughs> so two games two, before we go out. First, um, your your real name is Stephen Glover. Now, Stephen spelled with a P H. 
Middle name Gilchrist. Now last there's name another Glover. Stephen Glover. There's a number in history, but most currently there's another famous Stephen Glover. And I'm gonna I'm gonna Is he know with it's with a G and he's Donald Glover's brother. Okay. You know Donald Glover. So uh, how about that? Yeah, Donald Glover's this like wildly successful guy. He's yeah. got his hand in music, right. acting, like everything. I'm gonna ask you trivia yeah. questions about his brother. Because you should you should know about him. Okay. What shows did he write on before he became the head writer of Atlanta? I zero. Couldn't even zero. Tell you. It was his brother's show. His brother brought him in, Good. and they wrote a fucking killer show. And that's a message to Hollywood and the head of Netflix and everybody else: take a chance. The show won Emmys, yeah, Emmys with people. I like the same it. thing with Seinfeld. Larry David came in. The guy had never written on a sitcom in his life. Jerry had never written on a sitcom in his life. And they fucking came up with Seinfeld. Take a chance, people. Right. Um, yeah, right. dude. Uh, he wrote an episode that featured a fictional depiction of a pop star being portrayed in an exaggerated and negative light. Who was that pop star? Uh, sorry, it was a sitcom it was, about a pop star being exaggerated. It was on Atlanta, on an episode of Atlanta, the drama. Uh, I, I mean, I don't know. Is it, is it the question, who was the yeah. pop star that they based it on? Uh, you know, that was the fucking Andy Sandberg movie, Never Stop, <laughs> Never Stopping. It was, was evidently based Dude, on Justin it. Bieber. You God, got that it, movie that's the was right under, answer. Okay. Holy cool. shit. That fucking... I, I never saw the uh, the Atlanta episode, but God, that Andy Samberg movie didn't make money, didn't get fucking critical praise. It was so fucking good. If you want to watch a hilarious fucking movie, it's called Never it's, Stop, it's Never Stop. It's hilarious, and you know what else is fucking great? It's his recent movie, Palm Springs, which I just saw with my kids. Wife Ooh. loved it, kids loved it. It's just a solid, funny movie. Yeah, Andy Samberg, man. Wait, wait, what's his uh, his his comedy crew called? Like yeah, Lost yeah, Island or something? I think it's called something? Lost or... Island. They did the Dick in the Box and all that SNL shit. They they blew yeah, yeah. up the internet. Um, all right, and we're going to go out with, I, I play a game every week with my guests. It's called Rank Them. I'm going to give you four names. You're going to put them in order. There's no, I'm not going to tell you the criteria or the reasoning. I'm just going to give you the names and you're going to put them in order. Okay. Evil Knievel, Buster Keaton, Johnny Knoxville, Jackie Chan. Okay. Evil Knievel, Buster Keaton, Jackie Chan, Johnny Knoxville. I mean, I, I, I can only really... In interpret but I'm, I'm you know there's so much to interpret i'm gonna go chronological so we're just we're saying buster keaton then evil knievel then jackie chan like then johnny it. knoxville uh th these are these are some of the the greatest uh you know physical performers ever but i would lump evil knievel in not as much with Johnny Knoxville, or but 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 I would put Evil Knievel in with P.T. Barnum yeah. with Houdini, because because if you look at what he, Evil Knievel did on a uh, you know performance level, it was very one dimensional, and it happened over the fucking span of yeah, ten right, seconds. Right. You know, like he, 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 can you imagine being a fucking headliner <laughs> with uh, less than 60 seconds right. of material yeah. and selling out the fucking stadiums yeah. that he sold out, the fucking toys that yeah, he no had material. no material. Yeah. None. He was a porn star yeah. that only did and, the cum I mean, shot. The, the, Right. The uh the fucking the the unbelie I just see him as a promoter yeah. more than a performer, right. Evil Knievel. And and Houdini lived before the time of the television, before like uh, I mean, with such limited right. fucking media, Houdini was selling out humongous theaters in Russia and fucking like on every kind the dude was yeah. on a world tour. Right doing his shit and that's that's that speaks so much more to his promotional skills than to his actual yeah. performance ability and that you know and then of course there's pt barnum 
you know, so that that's like, I just wanted to to throw that out there. Like, yeah, I just, I love yeah, that shit. That is amazing. And it is what today's <laughs> entertainment is. Everybody needs to be P.T. Barnum or Evil Knievel. Everybody needs to come up with some way to introduce themselves right. to people where they go, I need to see that shit. I don't know what it is. To rise above right, the right. noise, man. <laughs> All right. Well, listen, Steve, yeah. you have rid you have risen above the noise. You are making some noise. When you come back, <laughs> you're going to be playing theaters. And uh, don't forget, check out the special, which is available at Steve O and uh, Steve O.com. And uh, don't forget to go back and get his yeah. uh, his old stuff. It's all on stevo.com, merchandise. Yeah, you know that 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 memoir I mentioned, which is called Professional Idiot. It's got a five star rating on Amazon, dude. I'm really fucking proud of that, dude. That book uh, has real substance to it. It's uh, it's funny. It's heartbreaking. It's it's all it's all this, man. Like that book is really my uh, you know my one masterpiece. Um, and Every copy, which I sell at stevo.com, is autographed by hand. You know, I mean, why would I say by hand? Because I think there are some people out there yeah, that actually stamp right. an autograph on there. I, I, I spend a lot of time fucking personally nice. signing shit and selling it at for selling it at a very reasonable price at my website. So the book is not going to disappoint if anybody wants a copy it's at stevo.com and please support gnarly. I wanted to fucking show those people who rejected it. And when I did that billboard stunt, I, I'm going to pat myself on the back for this. In the 48 hours following the billboard stunt in Hollywood, um, articles appeared online from Variety. <laughs> Rolling Stone, Vanity Fair, People, USA Today, TMZ, BuzzFeed, Deadline, Extra, E, fucking, like, did I say CNN and Fox? And <laughs> like, I mean, dude, and everywhere. I know how that felt to a kid. So those For a kid that's been trying to get attention since he was two years old, that's a fucking victory. <laughs> it's, yeah. a, it's a big deal, man. It's a big fucking deal. And, and uh... And, um, you know, yes, yesterday I, uh, donated $50,000 to the Los Angeles fire department foundation. And it's only been 24 hours since that happened. But do you know how many media that's outlets amazing. covered that? Yeah. None. <laughs> that's amazing. None. Yeah. I get it. None. You know, like, uh, they don't say none. Fifth Star Radio is uh, and, talking all about it. Hey. That's true. And dude, I don't care. Yeah. There's no grudge there, dude. I legitimately fucking felt awful having the fire department yeah. fucking take their time <laughs> pulling me off a fucking billboard when with yeah, fire season right. coming up, like, you know, like, uh, it, it, like I don't need any fucking any, yeah. uh, exposure for that. But I just think yeah. it is, I think it is interesting though that, yeah. yeah. So, Hey man, thank you, brother. I appreciate you. Yeah. I appreciate you doing this. Thank and, you so and, much uh, for coming on. I look forward to seeing you in person one of these days. Hey, likewise, man, for sure. Shoot me. Uh, I will hit, 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 hit stop on this one, and uh, right, I'll give you my cell number. Shoot me I'm a text. Stop dude, the we recording. Can link up. All right, thank you, Steve O. Goodbye. <laughs>